Today on The John Ankerberg Show, did God give specific prophecies hundreds of years in advance about a special person he would send to earth called the Messiah? What specific prophecies did God give? Where can they be found in the Hebrew Scriptures? Did the Jewish people to whom the prophecies came recognize that they had been given special promises that pointed to a coming Messiah? In this series, we will examine 16 prophecies given to the Jewish people from Adam to Abraham, from Moses to David, from Isaiah to Daniel and Zechariah. We will ask, do these remarkable prophecies prove Jesus is God's Messiah? My first guest is Dr. Walter Kaiser. He is one of the leading theologians and biblical scholars on the Hebrew Scriptures in America today. Dr. Kaiser is President Emeritus and Distinguished Professor of Old Testament at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary in Hamilton, Massachusetts. And second, Dr. Daryl Bach. He is one of the leading theologians and biblical scholars on the New Testament text. He is Senior Research Professor of New Testament Studies and Executive Director of Cultural Engagement at Dallas Theological Seminary in Dallas, Texas. Join us for this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg, and my guests are Dr. Walter Kaiser, Dr. Daryl Bach, and you've just heard their credentials. And uh, they're amazing scholars, and we're talking about a tremendously important topic, namely, has God placed prophecies, predictions, promises about a future person called the Messiah that actually took place. And we are down to putting the dots together here, the different prophecies together, going toward a conclusion here from the Old Testament toward Jesus, and we're asking the question, would God go so far as to name a specific city where this Messiah would be born? I want you to look at this verse. We're going to put it on the screen. This comes from the prophet Micah, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from the very days of eternity. Dr. Kaiser, explain this verse. Well, it is... A, a very specific verse because it not only mentions lowly Bethlehem, which is south of Jerusalem and out in the shepherd's fields, but it gives the old name for it too, just to make sure you don't get it mixed up, Ephrata. So you've got Bethlehem, Ephrata. And he says, uh, from you, there's going to be one who is going to come and he'll be ruler over Israel. But that's not the big surprise. He said his origins go way back from old, and that's still not the surprise. He adds, why, from eternity. As a matter of fact, the translators get so uh, uh, baffled by this, they can't understand. How could this be? So they translated from days of old again. But no, the text is clear in the Hebrew. He goes all the way back and is eternal. So this one who is going to be born has been here a long time ago, even from eternity. Now think about that one. Who would fit that criteria? There's only one, the Lord Jesus himself, the Messiah, the one who is the branch and the servant of the Lord. Dr. Bach, when we get to Christmas time, we've heard this so much that we kind of put it into, into a fairy tale, okay? And yet... This is in the Hebrew Scriptures and showed up hundreds of years before Jesus. And take us, even the Jewish people, when Herod asked them for advice, they went right to this verse. Talk about that. Well, I think it's really interesting. There's, there's something that's, that's embedded in the Old Testament passage that I don't want us to miss, and that is the allusion to Judah. The allusion to Judah takes us back to Genesis. We were told not only would this come out of, uh, out of Abraham, not only would this come from Jacob, but we were told which tribe this figure would come out of. This figure would come out of the tribe of Judah. 
So when the Magi come before Herod and say, we've seen a star in the east, we've read the, we've read the sky, something seems to be happening, do you know where your Messiah is going to be born? Uh, Herod, he's a politician, so he goes to the theologians and says, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? And they thumb through their text. And, uh, oh, there it is, Micah 5. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. That's where he's going to be born. And what's surprising about this is, is that, is that you would think if you were making up the story or something like that, you wouldn't have Jesus born in a little town of Bethlehem. You'd have him born in a capital city like Jerusalem. So he's here, born in Bethlehem, in fact, in a manger as we find out, showing the humble roots of this one who's taken on human flesh and who, has, who, who represents the divine mission in the world uh, to identify with each one of us even in his coming. I like to think of this passage as kind of a GPS. You know, people have their phones and they want to go from point A to point B. You hit Google Maps and, and, the, and the little slot at the top comes in telling you where you're going to start. You're starting here. You're starting in Bethlehem. Hundreds of years before the person was born, we were told where he was going to be. You drop that piece into the puzzle, it's yet another detail about who this figure is, yet another detail that connects to Jesus. Yeah. All right. Uh, it's a stunner. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's like putting a road map, put a flag on the road and saying, this is the spot. And, and uh, that it actually happened that way is amazing to me. All right, let's look at what God says about what's going to happen to the servant, just like he's very specific about where he's going to be born, he talks about he's going to die. Okay, and this goes with Isaiah 53, but it's really from Zechariah the prophet. Chapter 12, verse 10, let me put it on the board for you. And they shall look on me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they shall be bitter over him, as one that is in bitterness over the firstborn. Dr. Kaiser, this is an amazing, amazing prophecy. What is it saying? Well, here the Lord is saying, they'll look on me, Eli. Uh, who is he talking about? The Almighty. And uh, so they'll look on me, whom they've pierced. And the question is, how could God, the living God, have gotten pierced. They'll look on me whom they have pierced. There's only one way, and that was at the crucifixion. That's where he was pierced. And they'll mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And uh, they will be bitter over him as one is in bitterness over the loss of a firstborn, Zechariah 12.10. And uh, I think the day is coming very, very soon when all of the nations of the earth, but particularly the people God chose to be his uh, channel, a blessing to all the nations upon the first face of the earth. Remember the promise back in Genesis 12, 3, in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. But particularly Israel, which was supposed to be that channel, they too will finally wake up and say, oh no, uh, we had thought that uh, he wasn't the Messiah. We thought he was a, a Gentile. No, no, he's Jewish. His disciples were Jewish. The writers of his book were Jewish. And uh, he calls us. And they'll mourn and weep and come in humble adoration and confess that Messiah is the Christ. He is the Lord. He is the one who is none other than God who is among us. Dr. Bach, how do you get away from taking that interpretation? I mean, what is done? I mean, these words seem to be pretty clear. They are pretty clear. I mean, I, I think that it's a, a portrait of the fact that one day those who uh, were responsible for the crucifixion, the nation that was responsible for the crucifixion, or better, the leadership that was responsible for the crucifixion, the idea that Israel uh, had put her Messiah to death, one day they'll realize we made a mistake. And in fact, even in the early preaching in Acts, you have this challenge coming from the apostles that you put to death the author of life. Uh, and, and the challenge here isn't, it, it isn't so much to shake a finger in their face and say you did wrong as it is to look and see what you've done and the opportunity actually exists to correct that problem. 
the opportunity exists to rewind and undo it. And you rewind and undo it by recognizing who this figure is, by embracing who this figure is, by recognizing that he died in your place, that he took on your sin, that he dealt with your mistakes. And in dealing with your mistakes before God, reconnecting you to the living God. So they should look upon him who is pierced. Yes, they should mourn at what it is that took place and the mistake that it represented, but they need to move past that mourning. They need to move past that mourning to an embrace of faith that brings one to the one who died in their place. Yeah, and in a sense, these passages also tell us that the Messiah knew in advance and volunteered for this job. And he knew what they would do to him, and he still went through with it. And on the cross, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he opens the door to be their substitute and offer them forgiveness and doesn't hold, them, hold it against them. It's an amazing Savior. Well, it's the story of how God treats all of us, isn't it? It is. It is the story that all of us, have, like sheep, have wandered and gone astray. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. No matter where you turn in Scripture, what you see God continually doing is dealing with a rebellious people, not by spanking them or beating them to death, but by wooing them back to Himself, by offering Himself on their behalf and saying, this is how much I love you. And then the, 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 the picture that we should get is here's a God who loves us so deeply that He does everything He can to bring us back to Himself. And so hopefully we'll listen, hopefully we'll pay attention, hopefully we will come back to Him because in the coming back to Him not only do we gain His embrace but we gain His presence and His power and we also gain the blessing of being reconnected to the living God. It's great stuff, folks. You've got to listen to it and take this stuff uh, seriously. But we're going to end this program. We're going to end it with what I call the topper. God not only predicts that the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem, Ephrata. God predicts that the Messiah is going to be pierced. But then he gives us a time period of when the Messiah is going to show up and when he's going to get cut off, when he's going to die. And it's the, answering the question, who is the anointed one who's going to be cut off after 483 years? Again, this is Daniel in chapter 9, verses 24 through 26. Let me read it, and then you guys can comment. Seventy weeks, God says, are decreed for your people and your holy city to do a couple things. To finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. No one understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the 62 weeks, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. A lot of stuff going on here. Talk about it, Dr. Kaiser. Well, this is a beautiful prophecy. Uh, Jeremiah has uh, uh, given the prophecy about 70 years they would be in captivity. And Daniel reading it, uh, by the way, less than uh, 75 years later on, he is uh, saying, oh Lord, are you going to fulfill this now? It seems like this is the time for it to be fulfilled. And yes, as a matter of fact, he calls what Jeremiah had their scriptures. They were the holy writings. So they didn't wait for a uh, council or for a, a Jewish group at uh, Jabnia to really say which books were in or out. He already knew within a century they were received as being authoritative. And here in this prophecy, the Lord said, well, I've got 70 more sevens for you. So this brings up the famous discussion about the 483, the 69 sevens. And then there is a major break in which he says, and after these uh, 69 weeks, the seven and 62, he said, Messiah will be cut off. And, and then he said, the holy city will be taken too. Well, 
That was an event that brought us right up to the time of Christ, about 30 A.D., and the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. So there is a gap, and that gap has existed from that day until this moment. Uh, it is a period of time in which Messiah was crucified, the city was destroyed, and uh, yet it still has not concluded the last seven weeks, a time of enormous difficulty for Israel, but yet a time that will conclude the whole historic process. And anyway, he gives six purposes for these 490 years, 70 times 7, uh, it's going to finish transgression. Wow. No more sin. He's going to put an end to sin. Wow. And to atone for wickedness, that was done on the cross, and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and then to anoint the most holy, the most holy place or the most holy one. We don't know. And, and we just kind of go between the two. Of the, it may be both. But the point is, this is the finale. Here comes the conclusion to the whole story, the whole plan of God. And uh, these were declared for Daniel's people and Daniel's city, the holy city, Jerusalem. So it's very, very clear. And he wants us to understand. No, no and understand. This isn't to confuse us. He said, from the going forth of that decree to rebuild Jerusalem, uh, and he adds that all up, and he said, it will be 69 weeks until the anointed one, the Messiah, comes. So, it, uh, without giving us the precise day or even year, for our Lord said no one knew that, Yet, it does tell us very clearly there was a break and God is going to conclude it with one more seven-year period. Daryl? Well, the reason that's important is that for some people, Jesus didn't do everything you expected a Messiah to do. So some people say, that Messiah can't be Jesus. He hasn't done everything yet. And this reply is a really simple one. It is, hey, the story's not over yet. Uh, we're, in, we're in the process of watching this story play itself out. We've had Act 1, we've taken the intermission, there's Act 2. Now this is a very lopsided opera that I'm talking about because we had the first 69 weeks and now we're taking a break and we just have one very short act to, to follow. We have this one week left, the tribulation, which leads into the consummation and brings us to the end of this story. Messiah hasn't done everything that he is going to do yet. Jesus hasn't done everything that he's going to do yet. And the fact that we haven't seen everything yet shouldn't surprise us because Daniel told us there's more to come. Yeah, uh, I mean, let me even be stronger in the objection. Okay. I'd like to believe in Jesus as a Messiah, but the fact is we don't have peace in the world. And uh, he's not reigning over all the earth. And the Israelites are still under attack and a pressure, okay? The Messiah is supposed to rescue all of that. It's not happening, so why should I believe Jesus is the Messiah? Well, what we're told is, is that the tribulation period is an intensely difficult period for Israel, and nothing before the tribulation tells us that anything's supposed to be different for her. In fact, in the midst of the New Testament, Jesus talks about the house of Israel being desolate until she says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So we know that the world is going to be a difficult place until the job is finished, and we know that the period leading up to the finish of the job is going to be especially difficult. We shouldn't be surprised. We live in a fallen world, and until Messiah completely fixes it, it's not fixed. Dr. Kaiser, I want you to finish this by talking to folks that say, you know what? The Bible and those prophecies have persuaded me that Jesus is the Messiah, the one that God sent into the world to be my substitute, to atone for my sins. How do I come into a relationship with him? What do you want me to do? What does Jesus want me to do? Oh, John, I think what Jesus wants me to do and what this whole story in the whole Bible wants us to do is just believe, come and agree. The facts are too many. Look, we've just picked out 
uh, some 16 highlights here, but uh, that's only to show the main points. It is this one who came and uh, lived amongst us and demonstrated that he was God by his miracles and then went to the cross, died for us, was buried and rose again. And he went up into heaven and the angel said, why, you men of Galilee, why are you standing here gazing up into heaven? I mean, why, uh, when a person you're talking to goes vertical without a backpack or any kind of thing on, I guess you would, uh, you know, just be amazed out of your mind. But he's going to come the same way. So if you argue, is this literal or not? No, the text made it clear. So no wonder, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who will come again in like manner. Listen, friends that are viewing this program, you need to put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You really do. You were born to answer that question, and God wants you to put your faith and trust in his son. He gave you a lot of evidence now and he wants to take your guilt and all of the stuff of life and redeem your sin and make you whole and make you new in Christ. Won't you do that? You need to because he is your savior and my savior too. Praise be to his name. Yeah. God invites you to come to him just as you are with your sin. You would put your faith in Jesus and he will give you the power to live the way he wants you to live. It won't be perfect, but the fact is he will start to change you. That's his work in your life. But you need to start and you need to do it today. You need to call right now and just pray in your own words and tell the Lord you recognize you're a sinner. You're far from him. You feel separated from him. But you realize now he's inviting you to come to him by faith. You don't do something, you just put your faith in what Christ has done for you and you accept His gift, which is free, all right? And if you will, there's a promise that God gives in Scripture, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, put your name there in the whosoever, if you call and you pray, what does God say He'll do? Shall be saved. Not maybe if He gets around to it, when you call, He's he's open. He wants to save you right then. So I invite you to do it. And guys, I want to just say thank you for coming the long distances to be here on the program to share this tremendous information that God has given you, that God's put in Scripture with our audience here and overseas. I appreciate you very, very much. And folks, I want you to stay tuned for a moment, and we're going to tell you how you can get all of this information wherever you're at. So listen. Stay tuned for scenes from next week's program. If you would like to have all of the information in our new series, 16 Prophecies That Prove Jesus is the Messiah, it is available on DVD for a gift of $49. In this series, we will ask, who is the seed, the offspring of the woman who will crush the head of Satan? Where did God say he would come and dwell among the tents of the Semites? Who is the promised seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that will bless all the nations? Who is the future prophet like Moses, of whom God says, you must listen to him? Who is the one that will come from David's line that God promises to establish his kingdom forever? And when David writes, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, who is the future son of David that he calls Lord that will also sit at God's right hand? Who is the child born that is God who will have an everlasting kingdom? The four programs in this important series are available on DVD for a gift of $49. Then our second series is part two of 16 prophecies that prove Jesus is the Messiah. The four programs in this series are also available for a gift of $49. Here, we present eight additional prophecies that predict the specific city Messiah will be born, his death and resurrection. We will ask, 
who was the one pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities? Upon whom did the Lord lay the iniquity of all mankind? Who was assigned a grave with criminals, but ended up in a rich man's tomb? Who did the Lord crush and cause to suffer and make his life a guilt offering? Yet afterward, God promised he would see the light of life. Who is the righteous branch, the wise king who will be called Jehovah our righteousness? Who was the predicted anointed one who was cut off 483 years after the command to rebuild Jerusalem? Who is the one who is eternal, who will be born in Bethlehem Ephrata? Who is Jehovah, the one they have pierced, for whom Jerusalem and all the nation of Israel will someday weep and mourn? The four programs in this series are available on DVD for a gift of $49. Then third, we have written two new study guides with extensive notes that parallel our two television series. Each of these study guides contains four sessions for your personal study or Bible study group and is available for a gift of $8 each or for five or more copies for $5 each. And finally, if you wish to order all four of these items together, that is both television series, 16 Prophecies That Prove Jesus is the Messiah, Part 1 and Part 2, plus the two study guides, they are available together in a special package for only $99. And to order now, you may call us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. You may also call the same number on any workday, or you may order these programs now at our website at jashow.org. Well, thanks for being with me today. As we close, I'm also going to make available to you my book written with Dr. Walter Kaiser and Dr. John Weldon. It's called The Case for Jesus the Messiah. In this 230-page book, we prove that if Jesus was not the Messiah, then there is no Messiah and there can be no Messiah. If you will order our $99 package of materials today, I will include this informative book absolutely free. To order now, just call us at 1-800-805-3030. to learn how to start a relationship with Jesus Christ, go to our website at jashow.org and click on Pray to Accept Jesus Christ as Your Savior.